Okay, thank you. So, um, I'm all geared up here. I'm not going to sing for you, it's just... Um, <laughs> I always start with a um, personal story. Uh, because uh, I need to prepare you for what is to come. And not everybody is used to thinking about hospice and palliative care in terms of public health. So when I was um, six years old, my father decided to send me on an errand. Um, my father was a smoker in those days, and um, he pushed some money into my hand and said, son, I need you to go down to the corner shop and get me a pack of camels, camel cigarettes. I was um, thrilled that he asked me to do this thing for him because uh, I had done several errands for my father before, uh, all of them unsuccessful. I either came home with the wrong thing or um, didn't come home with anything or didn't come home. Um, so I was pleased to have one, one more chance to prove my mettle. And I took the money and I started walking down the street to the shop and I kept repeating to myself, camel, camels. I must remember camel, 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 camel. And I walked all the way down the street repeating this. And I finally got to the shop and I turned into the shop and there was this large man behind the counter. And he leaned towards me and he said, how can I help you? And I felt a moment of nausea and euphoria and I leaned towards him and I said, can I have a pack of donkeys? I, I think at the time we were both stunned at that. But he said to me that he didn't have any donkeys. And I said, he, he must be hiding them. And he said, I must be mistaken. And I said, I couldn't be mistaken or my father wouldn't have sent me to get them. And he said, that's ridiculous. And I said, I didn't know what that meant. And at that point, communication broke down and I started my journey back home empty-handed. When I got home, my father said to me, why, why did you ask for donkeys? And I thought about this. I actually thought about it on the way home when I realised what had happened. I've thought about it since, which is why I still have the memory. And the main reason I think I said that was, I really like donkeys. And it was at that point I realised, deep inside me, I had this thing called bias. And as I became an adult, I realised that most adults have bias. And when I became an academic, I realised everyone had bias. In fact, that's called epistemology, but that's another story. When you think of hospice, and when you think of palliative care, you have a particular image about what that's all about. That's your donkey. I'm selling you camels today. Don't keep thinking donkeys when I'm talking or you're going to have a very uncomfortable 40 minutes. All right, let's see, here we go. What's the problem with hospice? The problem with hospice is that they're geographically unviable. You'd have to have a hospice on every street corner to address the death and dying and ageing and caregiving and grief and loss issues for the world. It's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. We're not going to get a hospice on every street corner. 
Not only that, even if you did. You know, I did some work for UNESCO in the Republic of Moldova a few years ago, and they built a 12-bed hospice in the mountains. At any one stage, they had two or three of those beds occupied. They always had about nine vacant beds. In Moldova, nobody can afford a car. Those who can afford a car can very rarely afford the, the petrol. And even if they can get out to that lovely hospice in the mountains, they can't necessarily get back. And if they get back, they can't visit their dying loved one in that hospice. Building buildings is not the way forward. It might have been a good idea in London in the 60s, but it isn't anymore. The other thing is that hospices really were developed at a time when cancer was the main issue, and the hospices were mainly concerned with cancer, but that's not actually how people die these days. Most people who die, die over the age of 60, 65, and they die of multiple, multiple illnesses, multiple morbidities. A person who has cancer, has a neurological disease, has organ failure, has dementia, one of them will kill them, but that is not how they will die. They will die characteristic of a collection of illnesses. The cancer focus in hospice and palliative care is insufficient to the task of modern dying. Then there's psychosocial. People often say, well, Alan, you know, hospices and palliative care have been dealing with uh, social issues for a long time. We've got psychosocial. Psychosocial palliative care. And I'm always fond of saying, you know what the problem with psychosocial palliative care is? It's always more psycho than social. It always slides back to face-to-face -face work. And that brings me to the idea that the idea of community has failed hospice. What is community traditionally for hospices? It usually means that's where our patients come from, that's where we get our volunteers from, that's where we raise our funds, that's where we can raise awareness. Community is not a partner. It's not a partner. It's not a group that tells us how to care for the dying, how to care for grieving, how to care for caregivers. And finally, we need a public health approach because in every healthcare speciality, there's a public health approach. No cardiologist thinks that heart health is about cardiology. No one thinks that. You see a cardiologist when you, when you have a heart problem. Heart health is about eating right and about exercising. It's about health promotion. When you go to the supermarket, you look at all the cereals. Most of you know that. You're not going to buy the cereal with 100% sugar. You buy the healthy one, the one with 80% sugar. That's what heart health is about. Same with accident and emergency. No accident and emergency department believes that it's the last word on accident and emergency. That's why you're supposed to wear a bicycle helmet. That's why you're supposed to wear a seatbelt. What are the hospice and palliative care equivalents? All right. So we need to expand our healthcare to include community as genuine partners. That's what the public health approach is about. The community are not simply targets for service provision. When I look at you, I do not see patients. I just see ordinary men and women, citizens, school teachers, receptionists. Accountants, lawyers, garbage collectors, taxi drivers, housewives, students. That's what I see. Not patients. And not potential patients either. 
So we need to move hospice away from this direct services, clinical, face-to-face, -face, acute care, bedside, institutional approach, and all those words mean the same thing, to a community's neighbourhood civic partnership approach. Each one of us participates in our own health care, and each one of us must participate in end-of-life care. It's exactly the same. Why would you want to do this? Why would you want to do this? Nobody these days waits for a disaster to happen. In Japan, they don't wait for an earthquake to happen before they do something. They prepare. In Florida, they don't wait for the hurricane to hit. They prepare. They build buildings in a certain way. They have training programs in schools and in workplaces to know what's going to happen. Everybody knows how to board up a window. It's called prevention and harm reduction and early intervention. Everybody does it. Cardiology does it, accident and emergency does it, mental health does it, psychiatry does it, hospice. We're the newest kids on the block. We were born as an acute care model, a clinical model, a health services model, and we forgot that we're supposed to do the upstream stuff as well. We also have to address the morbidity and mortality. Now, I know a lot of you are probably thinking that palliative care is about dying people and grieving people. Actually, you know what? Dying and grieving is not the problem. It's what goes along in the journey that's the problem. It's the anxiety. It's the depression. It's the job loss. It's the stigma. It's the loneliness. It's the social isolation. It's the suicide. It's the sudden death. These are the things that make dying and grieving a problem. And these are the things which often characterise dying and caregiving and grieving. And all of those things are amenable to prevention or harm reduction or early intervention. We can't prevent death. We can't prevent grief. But we can prevent the harms which accompany dying, caregiving and grieving. All of those things I mentioned and more are preventable. Then there's the 40% rule. 40% of the people who attend GPs don't need to be there. It doesn't matter if you read the American studies or the British studies. It's the same figure. 40% of the people who attend GPs don't need to be there because they have an acute self-limiting limiting condition which, if they just sit there and ignore it, will get better by itself. Or the other big group is that they're anxious about something and they need to check something with their doctor. And the other big group is that they're lonely and the doctor is one of the few people they can go and visit and have a conversation with at least for 10 minutes. As the budget's reduced, it'll be seven minutes next. That's the 40%. There's social relationship issues. And then there's the 95% rule. No matter what you're dying of, and no matter how severe your bereavement, you will spend less than 5% of your time in front of a doctor, or a social worker, or a psychologist, counsellor. You will spend 5% or less. 95% of the time dying people spend, they spend alone, or with friends, or with family, or with their animal companion, 
or the television or the internet. So the question you've got to ask is, what are we doing in that 95%? And the answer is, not much. I recognise that not just in the UK, but just about everywhere, the United States is a slight aberration, but there's a reason for that. Just about everywhere, we've come to the end of our healthcare budget. You can rail against the Tories all you like, but Labor's not going to make a big difference either. We've come to the end of that piece of string where we can ask governments to keep paying for our health care. Not going to get significantly more money. We're not going to have a huge explosion of hospices and palliative care services. It's not happening. You're dreaming. The historical trend has been plain since the Second World War. We need alternative practice models, different ways of doing things with what we've got. And that means that end-of-life care has to be everybody's responsibility, not just hospice and palliative care. This means we have to go beyond an illness-bound view of health and illness. It means that you here, if you don't have a terminal illness, are also in need of palliative care, health-promoting palliative care. End-of-life care is something for all of us. Grief is not just somebody who has a bereavement because their partner has died of cancer. Grief and loss is everywhere. And it's a major issue. It is the elephant in the room. And I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. So this means that palliative care, end-of-life care, has to include older people, the well, as well as the ill, and carers and the bereaved. Too often we think of palliative care as care of the dying. We forget that palliative care also includes grief and loss and caregivers. You read every palliative care policy document in Britain since the 80s and they've always been included. But consistently, we forget about these people. And it means that palliative care, end-of-life care generally, must make its way into schools and in businesses, unions, places of worship, everywhere. Everywhere. So, what is the public health approach? What is the nitty-gritty? What practically is public health? So you could go and do a Master of Public Health degree, probably here at the University of Plymouth, an MPH, and they'll charge you nine or 10,000 pounds. But if you remember this slide, I will save you that nine or 10,000 pounds. Here it is here, your big opportunity, save 9,000 quid. Just remember this, this is what palliative care is. It's prevention. We all know what prevention is, right? What a good example of prevention. No, actually seatbelts is not prevention, it's harm reduction. Prevention is like a condom. <laughs> prevention is a condom. Very good prevention, I think. Harm reduction is, a, is a, a, and a good example of harm reduction is in fact a seatbelt. So in the old days when we didn't have a seatbelt, you'd go through the windscreen and get decapitated. A very common outcome of not wearing a seatbelt. And if you're decapitated, it's extremely dull. You're unpopular at parties. No one wants to talk to you. You have a sore throat all night. Now, if you wear a seatbelt, the worst case scenario is if you've survived the accident, you might have to have replace your spleen um, through damage caused by the seatbelt. But the medical opinion is losing a spleen has a better prognosis than losing your head. Then there's health and death education. I've already mentioned uh, the business about the cereal. But um, there are a lot of other matters that relate to health education as well. The thing about health education is that we don't get taught it. It's part of a culture. Education permeates because we learn it at school, we learn it in the workplace. We pick it up from our friends. After this conference, 
if we go to dinner and I order the battered fish and chips, somebody will say, that's a good choice, that's quite good here. Next night we go out to dinner, I order the battered fish and chips, and somebody will say, oh, Alan, you love your battered fish and chips. Mm -hmm. Third night we go out to dinner, I order the battered fish and chips. Silence. Awkward silence. Fourth night we go out to dinner, I order the battered fish and chips. Now I know, particularly since there's a large group of health professionals here, you will not be able to restrain yourself. Somebody will say, Alan, four nights in a row, battered fish and chips, you can't keep doing this. You'll kill yourself. Choose something healthier. Try the hamburger. <laughs> so these are not doctors who are telling me this. It's my own friends and colleagues. There's a culture now of health, which is an important change since the 1930s and 1920s and 1950s. And yes, it's yet to go out to all social classes and all occupational groups, but it's spreading. The culture of health promotion is spreading. And then there's the participatory relationships. So we learn that it's not what we tell people, but it's the way in which we work together to change things. Doctors have been saying people shouldn't smoke for 100 years. It's had no impact. <laughs> it's had no impact. They're still saying you shouldn't smoke. And it's, it's unlikely that it's having any impact. What is having an impact is workplace policies, legislation, civic changes, anti-smoking culture. People are saying, I don't like that smell anymore. Smoke over there. That's what's made a huge difference. We have moved on. Doctors keep telling you not to do things. That hasn't changed. They'll keep doing that for another 100 years. They've done it for the last 100 years. And then there's community development. That's the idea that communities work together to bring their own changes. Neighbourhood Watch is a good uh, example of that. You have Neighbourhood Watch here in Plymouth? More cops on every street corner. There's a crime here and a crime there. We need more police, more police. But actually, the interesting thing about the judiciary system and including the police is that there's a limit to how many cops you can put on the street. And even if you double them, they still won't stop your burglaries and assaults. In the end, you're going to have to take some kind of responsibility. And we spent some 50 years telling each other not to look into each other's backyard because of privacy, respect people's privacy. Now we have to roll back that idea. Maybe if you see somebody crawling into your neighbour's house through a back window and it's not your neighbour, maybe it's a good idea to phone the cops. And that's called Neighbourhood Watch. Imagine if we did that for death, dying and loss. And then there's service partnerships. One of the interesting things is that the health services actually exist in silos. The aged care people rarely talk to the palliative care people. The palliative care people rarely talk to the public health people. Public health people are my favourite. Biggest death deniers since medicine in the 1950s. Public health people. They're obsessed with anti-smoking and obesity but think that death is a failure. The palliative care people know that that's not true, death and dying and losses everywhere, but haven't quite got the public health methodologies that they need. It's a marriage made in heaven, but they exist in silos. The neurologists don't talk to the cardiologists. The heart health people don't talk to psychiatry. And that's the way it is. But in the future, we're going to have to break those silos down. We're going to have to start working with each other. Those service partnerships are absolutely crucial. And finally, there's the ecological settings em emphasis. So this is uh, the idea that we manipulate physical environments and social environments to change behaviour. It's a tricky one to explain, so I always give you another story. I've been a professor of palliative care on and off for 20 years. But before I was professor of palliative care in Australia, 
I was professor in drug and alcohol studies. It's a very odd part of my career. If you buy me a vodka, I'll tell you all about it. If you buy me two, I'll tell you anything you want to hear. But I ran uh, the research division of a large quasi-autonomous non-government organisation. I had a research staff of about 30 researchers. We had about 70 clinicians and we had about 30 or 40 education and training people. This was in the city of Melbourne with 3 million people. Um, next to Melbourne, 50 kilometres away, was a small working class city called Geelong. Geelong had uh, about 200,000 people, three employers, Shell Oil Refinery, Ford Motor Car Company, Pioneer Concrete. And every Friday and Saturday night, the workers would descend upon the city and destroy it. It was an, an honourable tradition that had gone on for decades since the Second World War. Um, the richest people in Geelong were the window replacement firms. So they had tried, Geelong City had tried everything. The local council had tried everything. The Department of Health had tried everything. The emergency services had tried everything. They tried the um, Russian solution, which is a forced re-education uh, training. So they'd arrest all the drunks and then instead of putting them in prison, they would force them to undergo three days on the evils of drinking. That didn't work. Then they tried the American solution, which is to arrest everybody and put them in jails. And um, the American solution um, produced the American problem, which was all the jails were full and they had nowhere else to put future drunks. So that didn't work. So eventually they beat a path to my door at Turning Point Alcohol and Drug Centre. This was the um, local government representatives, the uh, emergency services, the, the Chamber of Commerce and the Department of Health. There was about eight or nine of these people who came to my office one day and said, um, told me what the problem was and said, can you help us? And I said, yes, yeah, we can help you. I mean, anybody who works in drug and alcohol knows this stuff. We can help you, um, but we're not going to help you unless you agree to do everything we say for six months. And they agreed. They were <laughs> desperate. So I sent half a dozen of my best researchers to Geelong every Friday and Saturday night. When I say my best researchers, my most observant people. These are the people who would know that if you come in with mismatched socks, they will be able to point that out to you, or if you change your hairstyle. I sent those kinds of people to Geelong every Friday and Saturday night for six weeks, and we made a, a number of observations. They came back and we designed 27 interventions. I won't go through the 27 interventions, but I'll give you some examples. We put food on all the bars of all the drinking venues in Geelong on Friday and Saturday night. We gave the police a healthcare role. They were not to arrest anybody unless there was a threat to life. They were to take them home. We banned happy hours throughout the city. No more discount drinks, no more free drinks for anyone. We changed the music at every venue on Friday and Saturday night. So all the venues were allowed two headbanging pieces followed by one quiet piece. So all the music went, two headbanging, one quiet, two headbanging, one quiet. We gave the venues a choice. They could either take out all the tables and chairs from their venues, or they could bolt them to the floor. Happily for research purposes, half went with bolting and half went with getting rid of them. The reason for that, as many of you will know, is that when people are drunk, they have a different fashion sense, and they think that tables or chairs should be seen as headwear. At the end of six months, the drop to damage to public property and the drop in personal injury exceeded 75%. Without talking to anybody, we just changed the environment and made it hostile to drunks and friendly to people who wanted to drink moderately. Now the question you've got to ask yourself is this. If you had 27 interventions to increase the quality of life of people aging, living with a life-limiting illness, living with caregiving and loss for Plymouth, what would those 27 interventions be?
that's an ecological approach. And sustainability is the last one. There is no point in doing any of this as a service. If you get hit by a bus or the St. Luke's goes bankrupt tomorrow and all of your community projects fall over, it was a health service, not a public health initiative. A public health initiative is owned and run by the community. Sustainability is crucial here. You're not running another service. You're not doing a donkey. The camel here is the community own and run these things. So here are some examples of the kinds of things. I, I visit compassionate communities and compassionate cities all over the world. And they all do different things depending on the nature of their community. And you can see those lists here. The biggest one I'm going to talk about today is compassionate cities, because that's what you're gearing up. Many of you are involved in doing these kinds of things already. I know that uh, through Gail's leadership and the leadership of St. Luke's, more broadly, you are doing quite a lot of community, uh, some good community stuff. So I don't want to spend too much time on, on talking too much about that. Post the campaigns, I'll, um, I'll single that one out because it's one of my favourites. When I was in Melbourne, city in the 80s. And when I used to travel, I used to go to Tullamarine Airport, which is the international airport in Melbourne. I'd go to the toilet and I'd go into a cubicle and I'd close the cubicle door. And at the back of the cubicle door was a condom poster. HIV AIDS Alliance. But my public health colleague. At that time in the 80s, you couldn't hide from condom ads. You couldn't hide from them. They were in workplaces, they were in the toilets, they were on the streets, they were everywhere. What's remarkable about that? I'll tell you what's remarkable about that. In Australia, a country of 20 million, we lost 40 to 50 people a year from AIDS. Now, it's 40 or 50 too many, but at the end of the day, it's 40 or 50. And I could not escape from the messages of my colleagues in HIV AIDS Alliance. At that same time, I could fill the Melbourne Tennis Centre, 80,000 seats. Then I could queue it to Geelong, 50 kilometres away, with people who were bereaved in that state. Over 100,000 people. And not one of them, not one of them, ever saw a poster from the Palliative Care Service about grief and loss. Not one poster that said listening is better than talking. Nothing. What were my palliative care colleagues doing? They were building bloody hospices. That's what they were doing. Too damn busy developing their clinical staff to worry about prevention and harm reduction. They'd rather put their money into a counsellor than a public education campaign. And there's a nursing home pub. In Ireland, there was an experiment. The thing about this argument about where you should you die? Should I die at home? Should I die in a hospital? Should I die in a hospice? It's the wrong questions. For a lot of people, hospital, hospitals are nice places to die. A lot of Asians think hospitals are nice places to die. And a lot of homes are awful, bloody awful. You'd have to have your head red to want to die at home because of the politics at home. You've got some kind of crazy mother there or some lunatic father, a brother who you've never reconciled to. You'd be hell dying at home for some people. 
It's not the institution which is the problem. The problem is, what does that institution model itself on? That's the problem. If a hospital models, if a hospice models itself on a hospital, you've got a problem. If that's its role model, you've got a problem. And you wouldn't want to die in hospice because it's no different from dying in a hospital. If a hospital models itself on a nursing home, you wouldn't want to die in the hospital. So in Ireland, they had a nursing home where the life expectancy was eight months. So when you go there, the average life expectancy after you've been admitted to that nursing home was eight months. And what they decided to do was open a pub. So a section of the nursing home was opened up to the public and they put out a sign and everything. And people would come after work to go to the pub. Um, they didn't notice that much other than there was a lot of old people in the pub and the people who seemed to be pumping the beer seemed to be quite elderly too. But aside from that, it seemed to be a fairly ordinary pub and a very friendly place to go for a drink after work. They kept this up for a, for a couple of years and um, life expectancy doubled. Because at the end of the day, it's not the institution, but how permeable are the institutional walls to community? Because it's the social connection at the end that means anything. The social connection is the reason why we get up in the morning at all. Okay, so the Compassionate City Charter is designed to bring whole cities together, whole urban areas together, to work on their responsibility for end-of-life care. It means that there needs to be school and workplace policies. There's already school and workplace policies for health. Right? No school and no workplace thinks that if you want to health, you should go to your local GP. All schools and workplaces know that the health and safety of the people who work for them and who study with them are partly their responsibility. You can't build stairs where your workers can fall down and break their necks. There's a law against that. You can't go harassing people sexually at work or in schools. There are policies against that kind of thing. Now, I know some workplaces have three days compassionate leave for grief and loss. Let me tell you now, I'm incredibly underwhelmed by three days. You occasionally go to these palliative care conferences, which are always a hoot. If you go to these palliative care conferences, you'll often see a, a graph, a rectangle, and it'll say diagnosis at the beginning. Then it'll say prognosis about three quarters of the way down. And then at the end, it'll say death. And then they'll have a little triangle tapering off that says grief. I love that. I love that little thing. One day I'm going to get a bronze version of that. You know what? Grief doesn't last six weeks. <laughs> it doesn't last six months. It doesn't last six years. It's forever. So the question you've got to ask yourself is, what are our forever strategies? And where are grieving people found? Not hanging around outside the hospice. Not sticking their head in a fridge at home. They're at work. They're studying. They're at church. They're at the mosque. They're buying apples at the local grocery store. And they're playing golf. They're at the beach. They're on the internet. That's where we should be. Some people say, well, let's get it into the curriculum. Yeah, get it in the curriculum if you can. But I'm not worried about that. Everybody wants teachers to put things in the curriculum. They're overwhelmed. What I want is that schools should have policies to what happens when a student dies, or a teacher dies, or a parent dies, or gets ill or is grieving, or is involved in long-term caregiving? What will the school do for those people? What will you do in the workplace? You work for a hospice. 
What does a hospice do for you? If you end up with a life-limiting illness or you're caring for a parent with dementia, what's the policy? There better be one, St Luke's. And the local council will say, if you're a council worker, what is the local council policy? If you work for a bank, what is the NIB or Lloyd's doing? What is their policy? They ought to have one. Trade unions are the same. Churches and temples. Hospices and nursing homes have got to have community development workers. They're nearly all involved in face-to-face -face work. They're only just starting to think about community development. But the reality is community development workers are essential. Social workers are essential. So hospices have had a history of hiring social workers that have sold out, basically. Psychotherapists, family therapists, counsellors. But actually social workers are trained in community development and they're the social workers we need. Same with the major museums and art galleries. And there ought to be an annual peacetime memorial. Why is there only one memorial? And that's about the war. The bulk of death occurs in peacetime, not war. Why aren't we marching down the middle of the street and laying wreaths for our lost fathers and daughters and mothers and sons and dogs and cats and horses? One time a year where we can all do this in public and out without feeling embarrassed. A day when the community remembers their loss. This is not silly little hospice walk by the night type thing. I'm talking about a major civic ceremony endorsed by the local government, supported by the Chamber of Commerce, populated by the churches and temples. A community recognition that every day and every week and every month and every year people die. And every day and every week and every month and every year hearts are broken. And that we must remember our diversity in everything we do. We mustn't forget our people who live in prisons which is a growing old population, those who are homeless. We've been doing this around the world. There are now seven or eight compassionate cities in Spain. There's one in Germany, one in India, one in Taiwan. There's at least over a dozen in Canada. There's one in Scotland, one in Northern Ireland. There are several compassionate community movements trying to step up to compassionate city movements here in England. They're everywhere and they're growing. Plymouth, I must say, is doing a fantastic job and St Luke's actually has to be congratulated for their leadership here and they will probably be the next compassionate city in the UK and possibly the first English compassionate city. Success has been a greater participation from all sectors and a greater recognition of unconnected groups and new policy developments. There's been a new normalisation around death and dying for those communities who have embraced this approach. There's been lowered primary care and emergency service use. There's been a major study in Froome that has a compassionate communities program running alongside their primary care facility. And after a two year study, they found a 20% drop in emergency service admissions. 20%, that's a big saving for the NHS and a big progress in health and well-being for that population. There have been government policy changes in many countries, many practice experiments, and I've mentioned some of them. There are compassionate communities and cities in Austria, Germany, Ireland, India, Spain, Switzerland, South America. South America has at least 100 compassionate communities and at least four cities that are beginning to step up to coordinate with their local governments. There's a huge rise in papers and an international conference series now as well, every two years. Remember that the longer part of dying and grieving occurs outside of episodes of professional care. Never forget that. Never forget the 95% rule. That's where the action is. When things go wrong, it's only the 5%. And remember that palliative care is also about grief and loss. Never forget Palliative cares about grief and loss as well, not just the dying. It's a social, spiritual and psychological matter with a medical dimension. 
Love is not about sex. Love often has a component of sex, but it's far more, far greater, far bigger, far longer, far more mysterious than sex. And death and dying is more than the body, more than the medical issues. And invisible groups, such as the dying and the grieving, are subject to ignorance. One of the reasons why dying people and long-term caregivers and people who are bereaved experience so much trouble is not because of the grief itself, it's because of us and our reactions to them. And that's where we need to get with the program. We need to recognise the limits to service provision. There's only so much we can do as a service. And we store end-of-life care to the wider public sphere. We have to recognise that it, palliative care is everybody's business. Everybody. And that palliative care holism means the holism in our community. The mayor's office, the churches and temples, the schools, the media, the cultural centres, the sporting clubs, the streets, the internet, the TV. These are the practice implications. I won't go through them all. But the final one is the most important. People often ask me, this is, sounds great, Alan. What's it going to cost? What it's going to cost is your personal effort. What it's going to cost the local council is leadership. That's what we want. Leadership, an ability to organise meetings, provide us a room. It's going to cost the Chamber of Commerce, leadership. It's going to cost school principals, leadership and time. We're not running a new service here. We're running a new future. I ask you to be part of that future. Thank you very much. Political issue. It's one of the things about saving costs is that you don't then use the costs to pay something else they're trying to save. Now there's a debate about that. We argued in the Froome experiment that if we're saving 20%, if you kick back 5% into the community groups that were actually helping, now these are not just necessarily volunteers but civic um, neighbourhood groups, compassionate groups, um, that it would be an investment for the future to allow that 20% to continue. But that, that is a political argument, that's a health economics argument, and it's only just being made, just being articulated. So we're at a very early stage. It's a good question, it's one that has to be asked, but it's too early for me to answer it. Thank you, Thank you Jackie. Any other questions? Hello, um, my name is Gemma Cooper, I'm a GP locally and I also work as a McMillan GP facilitator for the area. Um, now I've completely forgotten what my question is going to be. I have to say that we've struggled with public health community, the professional community in public health. We still do. Um, there's no doubt that there are pockets of uh, innovative public health services, particularly coming from local government without a doubt. Um, and increasingly, deaths and dying and loss is being recognised alongside obesity, diabetes and smoking and all the other usual suspects. That said, if you look at all the major public health reports in the UK in the last uh, 20 years, and the bulk of the research money that goes into public health funding, even at this university locally, you will find there's hardly any interest in death and dying. And yet, you know, I worked in drug and alcohol for several years and the elephant in the room in drug and alcohol work is grief. Anybody who's worked in that area knows that. Um, anybody who works in HIV AIDS knows that grief and loss are huge elements to sexual acting out and depression and anxiety. Um, this stuff is everywhere um, and in terms of primary prevention it really is the proper work of public health colleagues. One of the interesting things about the public health movement worldwide is that it has been led by palliative care people. And really that's been a pretty lonely damn journey. 
we really ought to have had public health colleagues by our side. You have all the methodologies, practice methodologies. Um, you don't know much about death and dying. We know a lot about death and dying, but we don't know much about practice methodologies outside clinical work. And so it is a marriage made in heaven. And if um, you reach out to the palliative care people here in this city, then that would be a, a wonderful thing uh, and a great thing for this particular city. It's a long road for us. Um, and for a long time, you look at any public health textbook and you will see we're not there. And when, when bereavement is mentioned, it's mentioned as something for counselling or for palliative care. We keep throwing the ball to each other, um, passing the buck. But actually, it is very much a public health issue, not in terms of just of population health, um, epidemiology, demography, but also, and health services, but also in terms of the new public health. So thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I've uh, been out of my short sentence. <laughs> 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 um, so, so I'm Jennifer Bryan, a local GP and a facilitator. Yep. Um, yep. So um, one of the things you, you need, one of the things that was quite obvious in the Froome study was you need to differentiate between social prescribing and compassionate communities. Social, the evidence that social prescribing is effective in addressing uh, issues of social isolation and loneliness <coughs> is uh, ambivalent, equivocal, sorry, uh, at best, or not there at worst. So the evidence that social prescribing, um, getting people connected to reading groups or you know, tennis clubs or walking groups, um, that this addresses their issue it is not strong. But what happened in Froome is that if you can, and the other problem with social prescribing is that people need to be motivated and active. And in end of life care, what we have learned is that kind of thing doesn't work because quite a few of our patients are disabled. So compassionate communities are community connectors who come to the people. So this is, doesn't require the people to go to them necessarily. They go to those people. The combination of social prescribing and compassionate communities in Froome was the very thing that allowed um, the drop in attendance around primary care and emergency admissions. It's those two working together. That's the essential thing to notice. You as a GP, on the other hand, you need to think about this as a services redesign challenge. Because what happens in Froome amongst, uh, and by all means, give them a bell, call them, what happens in Froome is they use a, an on-site community development worker. So the community development worker is part of the general practice. So you develop a care plan for people who are vulnerable. That care plan is then handed over to the community development worker who then works on community connectors or community development as well as social prescribing. And the two together allow your primary health approach to be more effective in addressing the social determinants of the people who you see on a one-to-one -one basis. Does that answer your question? And that's also what's happened in Shropshire. Um, yeah, if you want to speak to me later, I can give you some names of people you might want to have a chat with uh, if you're interested in redesigning um, your practice along those lines. Thank you. About this. The morbidity and mortality issues around bereavement in the two-year follow-up studies around the world show that they're less among the people who attend GP. And the reason why is that the bereaved people who attend GPs are help, are help seekers. Uh, my, my, my work doesn't, hasn't shown that at all, so I have data from over 150 people. Who, are, who attend services? Who just literally, at that point in their life, they just, it's a, something new, something that's happened, and that generally they're seeking support at that point. That's right. And then they go back out again. But the yes. death may have occurred years ago, and it will, some other issues come up, and there's no sort of link for that. But these, what I'm saying to you in research terms, these are a bias group, they're health seekers, and the morbidity and mortality 
figures are greater than those who never see any professionals. That's the problem. That's the problem. And that's why the only way we're going to get to that particular public health problem is to have it in the places where we know they are, which is the workplaces or the schools or wherever it is. People who actually come to services are a particular special group in the matter of social and psychological help-seeking behaviour. Okay. Again, could you show your appreciation to our